this tutorial this summarizes a series of different perspectives of what the state should be doing. Uh, trying to just give you an idea about uh, different types of questions that can be raised and different types of perspectives that you, that could be used as a point of departure for thinking about what the state should be doing. Uh, I'll just start first with a series of different types of questions and then I'll give you this, this table about uh, different theories and outlooks on, on uh, these ideas about what the state should be doing. Three types of questions that can be asked about what the state should do. Uh, and these are based on, on different perspectives on, on the role of the state in society. So first of all, we have the entitlements discourse, the Marshallian rights discourse. Uh, what actions and services should citizens be able to enjoy as citizens? Uh, anyone who has become a citizen should have a right to access something. What something? So that starts uh, in, in this type of citizenship framework. A second question here that to ask is, is really based on who is an actor, who is delivering services. Should it be the state or private actors or maybe NGOs, someone else? Um, so who is doing the actual job of bringing services to people in society? The third question has to do with who is funding the services. Uh, where is the money coming from? Is it taxation or is it um, uh, user fees? Uh, these three uh, could be really useful to keep in mind when discussing how a welfare state should be uh, run and how services should be delivered. For instance, we could say that all citizens should have the social right of um, uh, some form of vocational training to help them enter the labor market. Well, um, fair enough, uh, who should be delivering it? Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, strictly speaking, if you're saying that it's a citizen right, you could satisfy that requirement uh, either through having the state deliver the services or have, through having a private actor delivering the services as long as the state is funding it. Both would actually satisfy the, the idea of social rights, theoretically. Uh, conversely, we could say that uh, there are uh, some services that in some places are run by the, the state, for instance, public transit might not, uh, might either be done through a public agency or it might be done through a crown corporation. Uh, in both cases, uh, it's very, very common for uh, whomever is doing this to uh, you have user fees. So you, you pay for your bus ticket, you pay for your ride with a with a light rail transit. Um, so uh, in this case, it's at least partly funded. It's a public good, but it's at least partly funded by the users. Uh, so uh, this these three perspectives forces us to think about uh, more than simply one dimension when it comes to uh, who, how a welfare state should be built, how a state should be built, and what should be the interaction relationship between the, in the state and the, the citizens. Uh, in, in this table here, I have summarized uh, how three different theories uh, really impact the ideas of who should be doing service delivery and why. So if we start uh, off with the welfare state kind of theories like Esping Anderson or T.H. Marshall, uh, you'll find that it's very, very common for uh, people within this theoretical framework to argue that the state should be d doing the service delivery because the state is the uh, guarantor of citizen rights and democratic control. And of course, uh, in a democratic society, uh, you will have you know, people go to the uh, uh, polls, they, they elect a government, and this government that is under democratic control then ostensibly runs the state and makes decisions as long as they keep the favor of the citizens. So in that sense, that's the, the, that's the rationale between why the state should be doing it, because it's subjected to democratic control. The citizens can vote the people in office out of office if they're not doing their job in terms of service delivery. This uh, second theory is that here, civil society, with, with uh, I'm 
putting Putnam here because it, he's really been the, the nestor of civil society theory. Uh, this isn't really uh, a field that has been uh, actively or explicitly challenging um, the welfare state or even intervening in the debate about how the state should be organized. But if we listen to uh, the types of framings of civil society that uh, the, the scholars doing civil society in the civil society studies do, uh, then we hear that they're arguing that this is really the natural and neutral arena for mutual aid and assistance and it generates trust. Now, if we take that logic one step further into the discussion about who should be doing service delivery, it really comes, uh, uh, the intuitive conclusion is that uh, maybe civil society should have a role in this, in delivering uh, social services. And in many cases, there are plenty of civil society studies that, that have looked into how, how citizens come together for the mutual aid of each, uh, of each other. They form NGOs, mutual assistance NGOs. It could be charities, it could be um, volunteer-based associations that serve community needs, community-serving organizations, uh, and this is done spontaneously, sometimes funded by the state, sometimes uh, on f f private fundraisers. Uh, and uh, if, if uh, civil society theory is correct, this generates trust in a way that maybe state-controlled service delivery would not. Uh, and uh, in that sense, it's interesting to contrast the assumptions about what is the role of civil society in, uh, in general society as opposed to the role of the state. So that gives you an interesting um, contrasting idea, set of ideas about who is doing what in society. And the third of here, of course, laissez-faire economy, new public management, the Chicago School, uh, discussing the, the virtues of the private market and really are advocating for introducing private market mechanisms into welfare service delivery. Um, and this would then ostensibly be because competition increases cost efficiency and productivity through these market supply and demand mechanisms. Uh, you will hear a thinker like uh, Milton Friedman arguing like this, and this is where uh, programs like uh, school vouchers uh, and charter schools uh, come from this, this uh, ideological framework. Now I'll, I'll add the caveat here that um, Milton Friedman didn't say that only private uh, corporations should be involved in social service delivery. He are also argued that civil society actors do have a role. Uh, he pointed to museums like the Metropolitan M Museum of Arts. He pointed to all sorts of uh, different uh, charities and volunteer-based organizations. He was more of a uh, limit the state kind of a person than uh, only advocating private markets uh, and, and uh, private corporations for service delivery. But if we look but if we look at how uh, governments have implemented these ideas of new public management and public procurement and public-private partnerships, it's really clear that uh, in many cases uh, the system has, uh, if not encouraged, at least favored in some sense, uh, the introduction of private companies into the service uh, delivery arena. And the rationale would then be that uh, these private companies are, are uh, better at giving citizens more bang for the bucks and increasing cost efficiency, allowing users to vote with their feet and choose their own uh, service delivery that way. And that's the rationale behind uh, that school of thought. So uh, this overview then gives you uh, a few different perspectives to enter the whole what should the state do uh, kind of a question.